There's not much. Oh, we are even recording. Timothy, <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me while I'm shouting out here? Yes, I can. Oh, good, 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 good. Because then, why we are using the mic is actually for the Zoom to run. It's not that I know my voice works. But it's also nice when the zoomers also can hear. But now we can hear, Mati can hear, everyone can hear. So I want to welcome you all for this very interesting session on global digital public good. Well, it's called digital public good, actually. But we, as in the years, we are putting global in because we really think that then the rest could hear. Because we really believe that the global aspect or digital public good is super important. So we'll spend the next two hours, actually, this is a long session, so be patient, but be uh, prepared for three very interesting presentations and then a panel discussion afterwards. And in the panel discussions, you all are allowed to comment as well. So we're putting in the panel here, people here up front, the presenters plus a representative from Nora. Uh, a representative from the uh, Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka and a representative of the uh, Ministry of Health in Timor Leste. So we kind of also bringing countries in. So we will start the whole uh, um, show with Liv Marte um, presenting the global public good, not the global, the public good, digital public good alliance, where she actually are to come with the, these days from NORAD. And she will uh, give us a bit of a background of this alliance and the, the digital public good um, concepts. Then uh, Pamud from our own this center and this Sri Lanka will talk about uh, the as an example of sustainability of a DPG. Because the topic of this session is how to sustain a DPG. It's not so only the the, the aim is to have a DPD, I mean, global public good available for people. It will also need to be there over time, be relevant, be updated, having a community. So this is the, actually the topic of this session. We will kind of shed light for different, different variances. And we also have invited Apti to, to present also from their point of view, how they work uh, on sustainability of uh, Digital public good, globally, I hope. <laughs> Everything is globally. And then after that, we will then continue with the, with the panel. So let me now just give the word for Liv Marte um, to tell us a bit about how it all kind of started and this alliance of philanthropics and other uh, global actors that are behind this DPG alliance. Over to you, Liv Marte. Thank you so much, Kristin. And just confirming that you can hear me okay and see the slides on the screen. Very well. Okay. So uh, as Kristin said, uh, my name is Liv Nordhaug and I'm co-lead the Secretariat for the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And I just wanted to start by saying how sorry I am that I cannot be there in person with you because I'm actually only 10 kilometers away. <laughs> But I am on medical leave due to complications during surgery, and I'm therefore extremely happy that Kristin and Pamud allowed me to address you virtually. Because I do know that this annual convening that you're part of is indeed a physical annual convening, and I'm very grateful for the exception that has been made for me. And also, the benefit is that if I say something completely stupid, I can blame it on my medical condition, <laughs> which I will do. Um, here is a very brief uh, agenda for what I will cover today. I will speak about digital public goods. I will try to be a little bit more clear on concepts than what Kristin was and only use digital public goods. And also about the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Uh, and I will end my presentation by sneaking in a tiny call to action, uh, given the audience that uh, I know is there today. So, let me start with explaining what digital public goods are. The very brief version is that they are open source technologies that have been built to adhere to relevant best practices and do no harm, and that they advance the sustainable development goals. And the concept of digital public goods may indeed sound like really old news <laughs> to you guys in the HISP community. And you're absolutely right. 
you came here first. Um, when the UN Secretary General established a high level panel on digital cooperation in 2018, his aim was to identify digital cooperation mechanisms that could help accelerate attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Nor <clears throat> Norway had a minister in that panel, and I was his advisor in the process. And we immediately pointed to DHIS2 and his as a highly interesting case. And as part of the consultations during that high level panel, we also came across highly relevant open source work happening in India, leveraging the experiences of India building its own digital public infrastructure. Uh, and therefore, I'm also very, very glad that Apti is in the room today. And they can share a lot more about that story. But just to conclude, I can truthfully say that the DHIS2 and HISP example was a key inspiration for the founding of the Digital Public Goods Alliance in 2019 and for the de definition of digital public goods that you see highlighted on this slide, which was presented by the UN Secretary General in his 2020 Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. So the concept of di digital public goods goes beyond software to also include content, data, standards, and AI models. Uh, but there is something we are not, we are, we are still on the first slide. That is very annoying. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I mean, <laughs> nobody has changed it, but uh, okay, good. Now we are okay. on the, the digital um, public good standards. So are we then on the same? <laughs> Yeah, we are. Sorry about that. That's a little bit annoying because then I can't see my notes. But that, let's um, let's try to keep it this way. Um, so this is a digital public good standard, and it really has three components. It's about advancing the sustainable development goals. Um, it's about open source, and it's about do no harm. Uh, the Secretariat for the Digital Public Goods Alliance maintains this standard. And it has been operationalized into nine criteria. So this builds off the definition by the UN Secretary General that I think you probably didn't see earlier <laughs> if I was still on my first slide. Um, that's the disadvantage of showing things from home. So but this is um, a key part of, of our work as the Digital Public Goods Alliance Secretariat. And in order for a digital solution to become a digital public good, um, there's a process where uh, a technology is nominated, then there's a technical review against these nine criteria, and then there is recognition on uh, the registry as a digital public good. We currently have, I think actually the number now is 153, because I think we added just a couple of more <laughs> in the last few days. So even this is outdated. So I think the number now, if you access our website, you will see that there are um, 153 verified digital public goods uh, on the website um, and, uh, and the DPG registry. And you will see that the majority of these are uh, mainly categorized as open uh, source software, even though there are often open data and open content components uh, as well. So just a little bit more about the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And I did mention initial, initially that it stems from this high level panel of digital cooperation that the UN Secretary General established in 2018, where his aim was to um, identify really groundbreaking collaboration mechanisms that could accelerate attainment of the sustainable development goals in the digital sphere. This led um, to the formation of the Digital Public Goods Alliance in, uh, in December 2019. Uh, it's co-founded by the governments of Norway and Sierra Leone, UNICEF, and the Indian think tank iSpirit. And today we also have um, UNDP and, uh, and the German BMZ federal ministry in the board. And uh, the secretariat is co-hosted uh, by NORAD, UNDP, UNICEF, and BMZ. And I'm seconded from NORAD, as you said, Kristin. And you can see on this slide, which I'm really hoping that you can see, so please jump in, Kristin, if you can't, <laughs> that, <laughs> uh, that we have um, a number of members. We're around 30 members now, and it uh, ranges between countries, philanthropic foundations, uh, a lot of UN entities, um, and, uh, and think tanks, and so on. Uh, and we're expanding quite rapidly. Um, and, uh, and we're very encouraged by, uh, by this growth. 
I want to suggest a little bit about how we work, uh, because um, the whole idea of this multi-stakeholder alliance is that the sum should be greater than its individual parts. Um, we are united by a strategy, a five-year strategy that has four um, strategic objectives. And they are around uh, the discoverability and sustainability and accessibility of digital public goods. It's also about the, the capacity of various types of institutions, particularly in the multilateral system, like the UN and uh, different UN institutions, but also others to promote, uh, promote and support DPG adoption and including to support countries. And then um, it's very much around strengthening country capacity, both to implement digital public goods and also to create, maintain and evolve these digital public goods locally. Uh, over time. And um, just to be clear, uh, when we talk about country implementation on, on the, as part of three and four, any financing or resourcing we mobilize through the Digital Public Goods Alliance uh, is directed towards countries that are eligible for uh, official development assistance. And, and the reasoning being that that is also where the, um, uh, there is most um, uh, lagging in attainment of the sustainable development goals and where the needs are greatest. But it is indeed an alliance that unifies countries across different income levels. And I think that's a very fundamental part. Uh, as I said, we're more than the sum of our parts. Uh, and, and one of the, um, the key ways we ensure this is that we have different types of activities where we drive a lot uh, of core functionalities from the Secretariat, uh, for instance, the maintenance of the DPG standard, the registry, we also convene something called communities of practice. Um, and then we have uh, coordinated activities, which we do together with members from the Secretariat. We're about 10 people in the Secretariat. But I would say that the majority of our um, value add is happening in what we call aligned activities. And these are activities that are driven by um, different stakeholders but that are in alignment with uh, the strategic objectives of the alliance, but are driven independently. Um, and all of this is tied together around the concept of digital public goods and the DPG standard. I mentioned communities of practice, and this is um, uh, one of our key um, ways of advancing, sorry, are you seeing? Um, of advancing high, um, uh, high um, relevance uh, technologies. Uh, so, we, um, uh, so we convene different experts around topics that are particularly urgent. So for instance, in health, we had one uh, around immunization delivery management together with, that was co-convened with UNICEF. We've also co-convened with FAO um, around food and NURAD, around food security and climate change adaptation. And we have had um, uh, a community of practice around the early grade reading. We have had around open data. We have one ongoing now around open AI models. And we have also um, recently had a big campaign to source new open source technologies that can help fight information pollution and restore information integrity. And I'm aware that this is also a huge challenge in health. So I wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, as I um, circle in and, and narrow in here, I wanted to um, bring your attention to a topic that is particularly central now within the work of the DPGA, uh, and which I know that APTI will probably speak very forcefully to, and that is around digital public infrastructure. Uh, digital public infrastructure, there are, they are these society-wide digital capabilities that are essential to participation in society and markets. And, uh, examples of them include um, digital identity, civil registries, real-time payments, and secure data exchange. You will probably have heard about a lot of these, uh, particularly now under the Indian G20 leadership and presidency, uh, as um, uh, exemplified by the Indian uh, stack. And we do see that there is um, tremendous demand right now uh, from countries to build out their digital public infrastructure and to leverage digital public goods in the process. Some of the reasons for that is that countries have um, experienced over the years uh, tremendous um, challenges with proprietary models uh, and, and vendor lock-in that have locked them into long-term 
uh, fairly rigid contracts where they don't have the ability to ensure interoperability between these different very foundational components. And we do see that there are more and more countries that are therefore turning to open source uh, and, and where digital public goods are a particularly curated subset, I would say, within that. Um, so this is a, an area where there is a lot of attention and interest right now. And of course, it plugs directly into the work that is happening more at the sector level and, uh, and systems that are being deployed um, in, uh, in different uh, sectors, management information systems. I do think that the HIS2 is extremely relevant also because it's being deployed in so many sectors uh, beyond health. So I do see that um, it's, it's of great interest, I think how we can link up some of these um, uh, some of these communities and some of these processes that are ongoing. Um, and that brings me to when I was <laughs> starting, I said I wanted to uh, uh, end this with a call to action, because I do think that, I mean, there are so many things that can be learned from DHIS2 and from HISP. And um, it's, uh, as I said also in the beginning, it is in many ways one of the cases that really helped originate and, and drive the establishment of the DPGA and the concept of digital public goods alongside a few other uh, initiatives. And I wanted to um, uh, bring us to a conclusion by stressing a bit what I really think that uh, these other projects that are now starting to emerge and evolve um, there are some very interesting ones coming out of India, but also of other countries. Um, and, and how can we help kind of build on and leverage some of the momentum and the tremendous achievements that has, uh, has been achieved by the HISP community since uh, it's, I guess it started in the mid nineties. Um, and I've chosen to summarize this by uh, adapting uh, and stealing a concept that was used during uh, Bill Clinton's uh, successful presidential ele election in 1992, when his advisor uh, coined the term, it's the economy stupid. Um, and the situation at that time was that uh, the current president, uh, George H.W. Um, Bush, was um, he was the incumbent and he was widely seen as not completely understanding the pains, the economic pains that the population were facing in terms of an, uh, the economic recession that was happening. And um, Clinton and, and his campaign, they really chose to drive home the mantra of it's the economy, it's the economy. And uh, that was one of the reasons why they won the election. And every time I get asked about what is it that has made DHIS to achieve the tremendous scale uh, it has and, and this incredibly deep and passionate uh, global uh, uh, crowd <laughs> that I think is in the room now. Um, and of course, I have learned this from Kristin as well. It's not only something I've invented, but it is indeed the community. And I know that this community, the HISP community, is something that has been built painstakingly and over long term and with tremendous investments in master student scholarships, PhD scholarships, all sorts of trainings, regional hubs, um, South South cooperation, and you know the idea that countries can easier learn from countries in their own region and that there is more trust also in, in regional collaboration. And I think that is such an important learning. And I would love for your help in helping kind of infuse that ethos, that way of working, that grassroots mentality, that bottom-up mentality into all of these other DPG projects that are coming now. And some of them are, are indeed being uh, implemented for um, digital public infrastructure. One example in kind is MOSIP the modular open source identity platform. And again, I'm sure Apti can speak to it. So I'm not gonna go into detail. I also know that Murad will likely address it later. But MOSIP is a technology for um, uh, <laughs> unique digital identity and verifiable. And it's um, currently being uh, implemented in at least 10 countries. Uh, and uh, and uh, there are many other countries that are interested. And I'm really, really hoping now, uh, and I know there are processes underway where we can find um, ways of plugging in the learnings and indeed the actual communities that we have uh, from HISP uh, and, and the different clusters 
to help bring in the same way of working, the same mentality uh, and so on to the most implementations and indeed other types of uh, open source implementations that are coming. Because this is really, um, there's a lot of demand for that. Um, I'm therefore also extremely happy that both uh, Sri Lanka and Timor-Leste are speaking afterwards. Um, I know that Sri Lanka has been uh, at the forefront of uh, doing a lot of integrations between DHIS2 uh, and other DPGs that are emerging now. Uh, incidentally, both uh, a couple that are out of India, including Divok in health, but also MOSIP, which is in process. And I know that Tamud can speak much more to this. But I do see um, so much promise in, uh, in uh, this work that is now being driven at the country level that can show a way of infusing the his mentality more broadly. I am also, of course, extremely, extremely encouraged that Timor-Leste is um, a part of the his community. I also know that Timor-Leste is exploring MOSIP. I don't know how that is going, but um, I, uh, I, I used to live in Timor-Leste for a few years and I'm, I'm very fond of, uh, of uh, Timor-Leste. So very, very happy to, to know that you're in the panel afterwards. <laughs> Uh, and and I will. Uh, I also wish you the best in in that journey of making decisions for your own digital public infrastructure. Um, but I think I want to end there and leave time for questions and just say that please help us leverage uh, the digital public uh, uh, goods community that you have built around the HIS2 and the, uh, the his community and please help us learn and uh, take this forward as part of a global movement. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any questions for you, Matthias? And people that sit in the chair, there is uh, plenty over here if you move around. The room is full. So come, there is uh, seats over here if you don't want to do the stairs. Any questions for you, Matthias, now? Yeah, Sabtashi. But we need, uh, in order for the Zoom rooms to hear, you know, either come down or... Tatashi is here in the form of PhD student in the mobile health project. I'm glad to be here. My question uh, Are you able to hear me online? Yes. Yeah, so my question is How is the How is this different from Dire Digital Impact Alliance? Uh, because it seems like the, the mission and the ideas are very similar to that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and Dial is indeed a member of the DPGA. So I think a major difference is that Dial is not a membership-based alliance. Uh, and also that, uh, but we cl collaborate closely. And also uh, the DPGA maintains uh, and stewards the DPG standard. So uh, Dial has been doing a lot of great work on digital transformation and is indeed doing a lot of work on digital public infrastructure. So, uh, and they are a member of the DPGA. So I would say that uh, it's, uh, it's part of the same ecosystem and uh, we're very happy about the collaboration with Dial. Uh, we also have PATH, Digital Square, uh, as, uh, as a member, and I'm sure they may likely be in the room as well. So, uh, so we're also aligning very closely with uh, the global goods uh, concept and, and the definition uh, in our work. I hope that was clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Tarja, Tarja Sander with uh, his IS research group. So um, my question is around uh, not, the, not the alliance standard, but standards in the in the registry where, where there are none at the moment. And you have the vision of supporting the construction of digital public infrastructure in countries uh, from digital public goods. But then I assume we would need open standards to be the connection between these different public goods. So some reflections around that. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Terry. And you're, you're um, grappling at something that we are also <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, very much working to uh, to uh, find our stance on at the moment, and that is whether or not we should have standards as a standalone category of DPGs. Because what we're doing now is that we are indeed encouraging open standards as part of software, content, data, AI models. 
Um, but we have been struggling with the idea of us verifying standards by themselves, because that requires a very specific set of expertise and very deep domain specific expertise. Uh, and there are many others doing that kind of work. So we are actually in the process now of figuring out whether or not uh, that is something we can do as the DPGA. So for the time being, we are actually not assessing individual standards as uh, DPGs. We're just assessing um, software, data, content, and, and encouraging open standards as part of that. But we, we agree, it's a very important area and it's not something we take lightly, but that's exactly why we have not yet felt that we are ready to say that we can uh, verify standards. Uh, I hope that made sense. And then Sophia, and she's the project manager for the DHS Super Education, and we'll begin more about tomorrow. Hello, everyone. Hi, Liv Marta. Thank you. So, it's so nice to, to listen to you speak. And I realize this question might actually be one that's where I should go home and do my own homework. But I also am really keen to hear your reflections around the do no harm principle within the, the alliance and the standards. Um, anticipating and thinking about how when we come up with new functionality or new ideas, how do we think to ourselves when we design? in it from a do no harm perspective you know i'm looking at access now and others in that space that can really share a lot with us about what happens in the world when uh, we don't think about this so any any light reflections and i promise to do more homework to see if there's more guidance out there on it yeah no and it, it's an excellent question and and i will say that uh, we have done one sneaky thing and that is to say that we're only assessing do no harm by design and that the reason for that is that we are only able to look at how technologies have been designed to minimize the risk of doing harm, but we are not able uh, to go out and monitor the multiple implementations of an open source technology in the real world and assess how each of them is uh, doing or not doing harm. Um, so, so that is, I would say in one sense, it's, it's a huge limitation, but at the same time, it's a disclaimer because it's something we simply don't have the capacity to do. Um, and, and, uh, that being said, I do think there is a lot of strength in being able to look into, for instance, how certain best practice principles um, and, and the standards related to, for instance, privacy and, and user security have been addressed in the design of a technology, which is what we do now. Uh, and also to have transparency on that, because we do believe that that at least gives a lot more power to those great organizations that are doing much more um, uh, accountability work and, and, uh, and uh, monitoring work downstream or at the country level, at the implementation level, to at least challenge if the implementations are diverting significantly from the kind of do no harm by design principles that have been integrated. But uh, I will not at all claim that we can ensure uh, that uh, any DPG in its implementation will not do any harm because we can't. And that's just, um, that's the reality. But we're at least trying to find the best possible ways of assessing the do no harm in the design phase. Uh, even there we're doing uh, reviews to a certain level of depth, uh, but we're not doing deep, deep, uh, reviews, which means also that before any actual implementation of a DPG at the country level, we do indeed um, expect and encourage that the implementers will do uh, a thorough assessment of the technology also because of the need to assess the relevance for the own context. So, um, but yeah, I hope that was uh, gave some useful direction on how we think. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Um, Prosper from HISP Uganda, Tech and Colleague, um, also implementing DHIS2. Yeah, uh, my question is about um, the, the sustainability of this kind of assessment and uh, the new of lines of, 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 of being in the list, whether this is going to be an annual basis and some, you know, DPGs can also drop off or get onto the board. But most important also uh, around the implication of this to the uh, the countries, if they're going to start um, uh, uh, using uh, the, these products, or also to the funders who are going to be funding this project, is there a guidance or is there an implication uh, to, to 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 being on this on this list? Thank you. 
No, thank you. It's, it's, it's an excellent question. And on the first part of it, I can say that, yes, we do uh, exactly as you suggested. We do uh, annual reviews uh, of our DPGs in our registry because we want to make sure that we have, uh, first of all, that they're actively maintained. So we don't want to have dead, dead projects in the registry and also in the event that there has been changes to the product so that they no longer meet the, the standard. We have actually had that happen before where there has been changes in licensing, for instance, that have led us to remove um, a, a technology or a DPG from the registry. So our ambition level is to do it annually. And the reason for that is anything more than that is uh, it, it's simply not possible for us. And we want to make sure that we have a process and a registry that we can maintain. Uh, so that's kind of, we have arrived at the yearly uh, review as, as the, what is realistic and optimal for us. But it's an excellent question and I fully agree that it needs to be done. Um, the other question is also very good around funding. And I will say that even though the DPGA secretariat, we are not maintaining a fund. We are collaborating very closely with funders and new financing mechanisms that are being set up. So one example is um, CoDevelop. It's a financing mechanism for uh, supporting implementations of digital public infrastructure. So you will find it if you look at, uh, uh, if you Google CoDevelop. Um, so we have been uh, very um, involved in helping establish that. We are also um, working very closely. We have several um, philanthropic and, and bilateral uh, financing entities as part of our membership. Uh, so uh, Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Omidyar Network are part of our members. And of course, we also have uh, bilateral donors like, um, like Norad, who will be in the panel. And, and uh, Eric from Norad can speak a bit more to how Norad prioritizes what it finances. Um, but there is a, so there is a financing la landscape out there. Uh, I do agree it's, it's a bit fragmented, but I do think there are trends now where it's becoming more better coordinated and aligned. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm actually quite optimistic about that. And, uh, and uh, uh, I do think one of the challenges we face is which DPGs uh, to double down on uh, in the sense of how how to really assess um, the demand and ensure that it's uh, in line with country demand and, and that we um, prioritize the right technologies. But there's a lot of thinking and work going on around that. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Two more questions. Are you, are you able? I'm fine. Thank you. Good. So then copy from his president of Africa first and then we have a later Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm coming back to the funding question because you uh, you have asked about the recipe for uh, DHS to success. I think some ingredient of this success are sustainable and consistent funding first, and then uh, championship from UIO, UI which kind of grow the community. So if we're thinking about Divo, we're thinking about uh, MOSI, have we already identified those uh, champions? Have we sustained a funding? Because if we have in um, one term funding, funding, then we won't uh, have good chances to succeed. But if we have somebody that can commit over 10 years, for example, then we have a chance to succeed over. I completely agree. And I should probably have highlighted a bit more strongly that even though the DPGA secretariat does not pro provide direct funding, um, I think Eric from Nural can testify that I, I have probably been among <laughs> the strongest champions that helped ensure that Nural is financing MOSIP, for instance, now. So Nural is a core funder of MOSIP together with the Gates Foundation. And, uh, and uh, I completely agree. Um, so I, I strongly believe that core funding, predictable long-term core funding for the DPGs that countries demand. And I think that is where I want to stress because as I mentioned, there are 153 DPGs in the registry. And I guess all of them are not as much in demand uh, uh, as, as others in the sense that there are some that are more relevant than others. Um, so I do think it's more about which ones would double down on, but I completely agree uh, with what, uh, with what uh, you were saying. And that um, this championship and this 
long-term and predictable funding is absolutely critical. Uh, I once heard someone, and I think it was someone from Gates Foundation who said that, you know, if you want to buy a car, you want to know that you get service on that car for at least five years. And he was saying that, you know, it's the same for a country. If you're adopting a DPG, you would at least want to know that there is a strong backing and commitment to sustain that DPG at least for five years. And I would go as far as say, you know, ideally you have a 10 year perspective. So I completely agree. So for the last question, I mean, this is a really keynote, people. Um, if anyone could come through a uh, digital presentation, it's Lee Martin, you will have a big hand later, but one more question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I uh, raise the question, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Maria Natalia. I'm working for at the Minister of Health Timor-Leste uh, in the Policy Planning and m and &E Department. Dia kala, mana? Dia, dia, agradece. Mana dia kala? Ah, dia kala. Obrigada. My question is uh, more related to the integrated, because in uh, Timor-Leste experiences that we have uh, uh, several digital that we use for the several program. One is the DHIS, another one is for the Liga Inan. This is the mobile message to the pregnant woman to access to the uh, service delivery, another one M supply, and then RSA daily, and then surveillance. So how we will be integrated those to the DHIS? This is the become the one of the technical um, issue that we are fun now because we are coming with the several um, apps and then the this is the one of the main indicator that uh, uh, from our boss need to be integrated all this. Thank you. So please give the solution. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is this is an excellent question, and it, it goes a bit beyond my pay grade. But I know that there are. Um, um, I'm going to be a little bit uh, sneaky and point you to Pamud because uh, Pamud Amarakun, who will be speaking after me, and who is also uh, following up uh, the work in Timor Leste, is. I don't think there is anyone who is better placed to answer this question than how you think about integrating DHIS2 with other applications and solutions and the considerations you need to make. Um, so, so I, I, um, I think it's a, it's a great question. It's just a question that I feel I don't have the expertise to answer in um, with the right contextual knowledge, but I know Pamud has. Uh, and from my end, I would like to say that we would warmly also welcome uh, Timor-Leste uh, as a member of the Di Digital Public Goods Alliance. We've had early discussions uh, on that, and uh, we are very encouraged to see the journey that you're embarking on and so proud um, and happy. So, uh, so, uh, but Pamud, I will uh, actually <laughs> ask you to answer that question. I don't know, Kristin, if you want Pamud to do it now or, uh, or as part of his presentation, but I feel you're in much better hands there. It's actually Mariana. a presentation coming just after, so I think that's a very good intro to Pamud. And I think you should give a big hand to him up And be part of this, we would say this kind of more um, panel um, for the whole audience. So we have three feet of the panel that we will have later. So, and uh, even though Ali Mart has been a sick limb, he is from sick limb, she has been uh, done a presentation, a splendid presentation, and she and I have been for a very long time. So, you are dismissed now, Ali Mart, and you continue with Pamuk. Solving all the problems there is. <laughs> and then we will have uh, Afki uh, presenting, and then we will have the panel to solve the rest of the problems. Okay? Mm -hmm. And please keep engagement because we have one hour and 15 minutes or something to, to discuss this very, very interesting topic. So thank you so much, Lima. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. So I don't know when you will address the question, but that will maybe come after. Yeah, probably come after. And we have a panel discussion where I think it will be a relevant question for that as well. Yeah. But yeah. So let me introduce Pamud while he's putting up his presentation. Pamud will now uh, uh, talk about, uh, and it's interesting to hear that uh, the whole global uh, digital public good alliance was inspired by the community and the demand and the vibrant 
community around the HF2 uh, as a global good. So that's interesting. So we will now uh, we'll try to, to conceptualize the, the secret yeah. ingredients behind that success to see what is actually behind the software, the, the technology. Um, and the market had, the, had the, the mantra of the community. But it's also the flexibility of the platform, the, the creating the relevance of the platform being so close to the field with all the local innovations in the field, with all the implementers in the 22 his groups that are the eyes and the ears in the field. So always make that keep the platform relevant. I think it's a bit underestimated. So over to Pamuk, if the technology is on our side, only in the stream mode now, then it will be. Ready to go? Yeah. No so oh, just have a screen. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that's good. Thank you so much. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Pamod representing uh, his center and uh, his uh, Sri Lanka. So I'm kind of uh, privileged to do this presentation on sustainability of uh, digital public good uh, based on learnings of uh, DHIS2. And um, I, I mean, looking at the audience here in person, as well as uh, the people joining online, I see like a lot of DHIS2 experts. So uh, feel free to jump in now uh, to any of the, I mean, statements I made, or like maybe in the discussion uh, uh, after the presentation, so that, so that uh, we'll all be able to share our uh, experiences. Right. So um, what you are seeing here is something that all of you are very familiar with. So this is where DHS2 is currently being implemented and used. So you see like it is there in more than 100 countries across the world, right? And out of uh, these 100 countries, I think uh, uh, if you look at uh, the majority, the DHS2 has been sustainable uh, in, uh, I mean, like at least for more than five years or even more. So the question is, like, is there a secret recipe or something why DHS2 has been sustainable and countries are able to keep on implementing, collect data, use the data? Uh, I mean, what's behind all this? So uh, again, uh, let me share like uh, our perspective, uh, but, but again, like we can have a discussion around it. So these are a couple of dimensions that we can keep analyzing this uh, question rather, like what, it takes, or so what does it really mean sustaining a digital public good based on uh, learnings from the uh, from DHIS2? So uh, I'm going to, in this presentation, highlight uh, all this in like five categories. Uh, as you can see here, I'll be talking about community and network and capacity building and research, documentation and knowledge sharing, platform, and finally, the funding, right? So, uh, I will just uh, start from where uh, Liv uh, left uh, her presentation. Like uh, she was really emphasizing, right? Sustainability of a, DH, uh, of a DPG is uh, mostly based on uh, the community and the network behind it. So when it comes to DHIS2, uh, what's the community and the network? I mean, are these the same or these are kind of uh, two different things? So in DHIS2, I think most of you must be familiar. We have something called community of practice, right? And you may all be aware, like the uh, the web URL that you can visit, it's a community.dhs2.org. So this is like the community of practice, but is it the DHS2 community? I would rather say like, this is the virtual place where we all meet, right? But uh, the community is a more of a tangible thing. Like we have, our, we have people, right? We have a lot of stakeholders, some DHS2 developers, implementers, some are administrators from the country, right? So the thing is, uh, this DHIS2 community of practice, so I will mostly stick to this uh, virtual environment because this is really helpful, especially during the uh, pandemic when we were not able to kind of roam around or meet others in person and come to annual conference here in Oslo. Uh, this is where we really were able to meet and we keep on doing that, right? So this is the place it's not a uh, kind of a developer gathering or a place where developers share their area ideas it's not only for the developers we have some areas for the developers to connect and ask their questions and get their issues clarified and we also have uh, places where implementers can ask questions or else like somebody doesn't even know about dhs2 can just join the uh, committee of practice and ask what is dhs2 right not only that 
uh, we have also seen like uh, sometimes uh, like some even post job opportunities. So we need a DHS to implement in uh, the country X uh, who can apply, right? So yeah, it's it's kind of an evolving thing. It's a, it's an entire community. It's like a mini world of uh, everyone who's using DHS too. So this is there. And this has really helped uh, new countries to know what DHS2 is and for the countries who are uh, using it to get, get their issues clarified and for the developers to, of course, be familiar of what are the real needs of the country. I will also be talking about this real needs to be very sensitive to what is happening on the ground so that a software platform can stay relevant, which is very important. So this, uh, of course, is like uh, kind of the hub for all this uh, to happen. So this is the kind of broader community of practice we have. And in addition, while the community is there, we have the HISP network. So what's the HISP network? So you are here in Oslo. So we have the HISP center in Oslo and we have a network of partners that share a set of core values related to open source, local ownership, sustainability, integration, data use, etc. Right. So this HISP network, is the in, is a kind of a more close network, right? Uh, which is uh, uh, as as I have mentioned here, uh, which includes a set of partners who have kind of common interests. So they work very closely with the countries, and you would also see DHIS two is not there, right? So DHIS two is the just platform, and HISP is a broader network, and DHIS two is supported by the HISP. But in addition. HISP is really working very closely with the countries in promoting country ownership and uh, uh, I mean like integration, just uh, referring back to the question asked from Timolis, like uh, how to do integration. So if it is not just DHIS2, like DHIS2 to XYZ platform, that's something like where we have to work very closely with the countries and HISP is doing that, right? And we have uh, 22 as of now and growing. <laughs> Uh, uh, his uh, groups which are in the network uh, covering Africa, Asia, Latin America, and of course, including Oslo. And most of this, uh, the HISPs are led by, uh, of course, uh, people with academic background of ha having um, academic background as in like who have obtained doctorate uh, degrees from the University of Oslo and other, uh, uh, other universities. And uh, uh, they also have a lot of implementation background working very closely with the countries. And of course, we also have, as the HISP network, have uh, very close ties with the local universities. So that rather than sitting from Oslo and trying to kind of uh, implement things remotely, uh, we kind of can uh, implement things which are more contextual working with the local universities. And what you are seeing uh, at the right corner is a, is a, is a list of HISP uh, groups. I think all the 22 are there. But uh, it's, a, it's a very big network. Uh, while it, uh, Even though it's, it's kind of growing and big, we have close connections with each other. We have frequent meetings online and on-site. Right. The next is uh, capacity building and research. So what is capacity building? Capacity building is training, right? Isn't that so? Is it, it's capacity building and training is the same? Question mark. Is it the same? Yeah. No, right? But like, yeah, somewhat related. Yes, exactly. So, uh, I mean, like one common um, uh, belief is like whenever we talk about capacity building of uh, DPGs or open source solution, yeah, it's about training, right? So we need to get everyone trained and then you have the capacity in the country. Is that the same? Not really. So when it comes to capacity building, this is something very broad. So it doesn't really, you know, like stick only to that particular DPG. It's more about... Uh, of course, they are connected, but like it's more about working with uh, communities, organizations, and individuals, and working across like building skills, knowledge, resources. So it's a, it, it's like a whole range of um, competencies, but at a much broader level. But when it comes to training, it's more targeted, and we 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 it will have some specific objectives. So the other thing that we have to know about capacity building is like you can't build capacity. Uh, I mean, we can't conclude capacity building within a short period of a TOR, right? Say like six months, one year, capacity building complete on DHS2 in country X. It doesn't happen that way, right? It's, it's, like, it's a kind of a long-term process and you have to work very closely with the countries and probably get uh, all the local people involved because like they only know what really works in the country, right? Uh, somebody from uh, say 
from another continent can't just travel to a country and build capacity without getting local people really engaged and empowered right so how so we all understand it's it's very important uh, to build capacity when it comes to sustainability of a digital public good and uh, what is our approach so we call it the hisp method of capacity building so it's, it's it again is something very broad which i have kind of tried to summarize in few bullet points identifying some important elements so the first thing is about strengthening national information systems for governance right it's not about strengthening dhis to capacity right it's we are talking always about something broader because for dhis to to exist we need to have something broader something more foundational in place otherwise we can't really have uh, dhis to capacity building uh, and and we always uh, work very closely collaborate with the ministries uh, so that's the main task the regional hisp uh, groups which i mentioned in the previous slide is doing and we really uh, strongly believe in the uh, Scandinavian tradition of participatory design. We work with the stakeholders, with the people, with the people at the grassroots level, so that we are kind of sensitive to what their requirements are, rather than we go to country X and say like, this is DHIS2. We have learnings from 50 countries. We know what you need. You, do, you can't be having something very special uh, that is only existing in your country. So please listen to us and do what we want. No, that's not kind of the approach, even though that is kind of very easy. That's why sometimes implementing DHS2 should be taking, I mean, quite long, right? So for example, I, I will take my own example from Sri Lanka. Like we have been trying to uh, implement DHS2 in a new domain called education. Emis, you will uh, hear more about it uh, tomorrow. So there we are really focusing on building capacity. We are taking baby steps because we, I mean, we we are kind of a, uh, we have a very good, uh, I mean, a successful implementation of DHS2 in health, but uh, we did, we were a bit, bit too humble and we were kind of being very receptive to the concerns of the education ministry and kind of trying to build capacity in their core team when implementing DHS2, even in a country which already has some amount of, uh, I mean, significant amount of capacity or uh, existing. And we work with the core teams in the countries. These are not like DHS2 core teams or his core teams. This is about like ministry teams mostly. And engaging, uh, the, the usually, as I mentioned before, the engagement is long-term. It's not really like, for example, uh, uh, it's not like, we have a current contract with the uh, Timor Leste Ministry, and if only we, uh, when we have a contract, we have to help. No, it, it should not be like that. So all these DPGs, which are kind of trying to implement uh, uh, their their own solution in the countries, have to work very closely with the with the with the ministries of the countries, and should not be fully driven by financial gains, right? So that's how the country uh, will be able to sustain because if the country doesn't have capacity and they only have a TOR of like six, say six months or one year, you should not leave them afterwards. You have to be there with them uh, for them to build the capacity. And the research, right? So this is an interesting area. Like uh, some of us, at least the practitioners or the implementers will feel Research is something very abstract and it always goes above us, right? It's something that academics are doing, right? By the universities. True enough, we are very closely affiliated to the university here, as well as all the uh, local universities the HIST network is closely working with. But the thing is, what we are always believing is, is the action research. So our approach has been that uh, building knowledge on implementing information systems while building systems on the ground through partnership. So we work with partnership with, uh, with different stakeholders and we, we kind of emphasized on building something that works on the ground. So based on that, if you talk about the University of Oslo, it has produced more than 75 PhDs, I think as of now. Uh, and then we have 30 plus active PhD students, including myself. And also like uh, we have a master's program here as well as few other countries that we have a partnership with, such as South Africa, Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and the country I come from, Sri Lanka. And of course, uh, there are like, uh, the other thing is like all this, like it's not like UIO has a lifelong partnership and support or like uh, the, the country in the global South will be getting forever funding to, to, take, uh, to continue their master's program. If I take the example in Sri Lanka, the master's program was set up in year 2009 uh, from the NOMA grant, which was only there for three years. 
but the country is sustaining that uh, master's program up to date uh, with the co-funding of the government, right? So that's kind of the country ownership and country taking it forward. Of course, the resource persons are coming from here and the network, but the thing is like, it has to be something uh, more long-term for it to be sustainable. Right, so here we talk about action research, which could be a technical term, but like, how is it related to all the different implementations we are having? So we do research here, and based on this research, they kind of feed into country implementation. Like this research that we do will tell us how best we should be approaching the countries and how best we should be implementing the DHS2 software in the country. Not only that, from a platform perspective, like we will get to know like what really works. Should it be that University of Oslo should be making all the different uh, software components like the entire core plus all the extensions should be made by University of Oslo and that's it, right? Is that so? Not really. Like the learnings have been that there, there have to be uh, many extensions. I think uh, we will hear more about this, uh, uh, about the, um, I mean, design lab and uh, many more in uh, coming days. The thing is like, we learn how to design the platform as well as how to build capacity. So that's kind of one cycle, uh, or, which is kind of like uh, the research transmitting into our implementations. But the other side of it is that like from all these implementations, we know what really works. So that, I mean, based on implementations, we keep on doing more and more research, right? So that's why, it, that's how it is related. Unfortunately, you are not able to see the first line in that um, a short phrase that you have there. So it was about, I mean, DHS2 has been uh, kind of big across the world, uh, so much so that a uh, couple of years back, I think uh, there was this report and, and it, like there was a feeling whether DHS2 should be a, a independent entity because it is so much of a, a product that's been implemented globally. But I think uh, what, it, uh, what, what came out of this uh, evaluation report by NORAD in, uh, in 2016, was that his uh, and the DHS2 should remain within the UIO, mainly because all this uh, implementation support, capacity building and research is kind of critical for the development and uh, evaluate, I mean, um, ev evolving of DHS2 uh, moving forward. So that's why the DHS2 platform stays within the University of Oslo and the HISP Center. And all this, Research, of course, is transmitted, disseminated. I mean, it doesn't have to be only within the academia. So it's it's not only this uh, academic publications. It's more about innovations, implementations, and uh, having all of education modalities implemented. Right. As a DPG, for people to know what the DPG is about and for them to implement by themselves without really having the core team of the or the DPG producers trying to go and travel to the country and implement, we really need a good documentation and sharing the knowledge. So when it comes to DHS2, what are the modalities we have adopted? So we, of course, have a extensive documentation, which, is, which has been evolving for more than a decade now, which is available there. But like this documentation is not only for the developers, right? So it's, it's more inclusive where you have the technical content, which is relevant for the developers, as well as implementation principles, which like in case if you don't have a HISP group in the country and if you have a couple of champions in the country who want to learn DHIS2, they can follow these guides. I mean, these are very lengthy documents, but we don't only have this very big 100 page documents. We have a lot of videos which are available in YouTube. One good thing that came out of pandemic amongst many others was that we were really able to conduct all our, I will be talking about it a bit later, academies online. <laughs> And all these are recorded and so many other uh, recordings are there and uh, everything is available on YouTube. I mean, it's not just for beginners. Uh, trust me, even I myself uh, keep going back, visiting these YouTube uh, videos just before uh, me conducting some training programs because like we, we can't remember everything, right? DHS2 is so big. So it's, it, I'm, I'm really glad that everything is there uh, online, especially the YouTube videos. So all these are really important. And you need to kind of keep evolving as a DPG. You can't just have, I mean, because it says documentation, you can't just uh, stick to a text document because it's documentation. And it's also kind of important that you have these materials which are reproducible because if we have a set of material which only we or like an expert can implement, uh, interpret, 
when he wants to uh, do an uh, do a training it is not so useful just imagine you have a country uh, which can't afford the experts to come and travel travel all the way there and implement they should be able to read these documents and uh, implement a training program so that's the kind of uh, strategy that we have been um, trying to follow and of course we respect the diversity of the countries and the cultures so that's why we have uh, the training material in multiple languages it's quite important if you want to become global that you have to serve all these um, uh, contextual you have to understand and respect uh, all these differences in the regions and our academies so these academies of course is something very popular and uh, we are in increasingly seeing uh, many other dpgs uh, following this trend which is which is really cool because uh, this we believe like all of us uh, have attended academies as uh, learners and we are now contributing as trainers so this is kind of like uh, uh, i will also explain it in a bit more detail so we have different levels of academies as we call it we have a foundational one which is more self paced which uh, anyone can follow and once you do that we have the level 1 which is like uh, uh, i mean a little bit more advanced but uh, mostly conducted by the regional hisps uh, and these are kind of uh, uh, it, it could be on site or online they are uh, held in different regions like africa and asia uh, and uh, the standardized material of course is produced by the uio and then we have level 2 which is a little bit advanced and then we have internal trainings for the low, uh, for the within the his network so that we can kind of continue our capacity development but the interesting thing is like the more you try to disseminate things uh i mean they can be slightly unstructured right and this is where like the governance of entire thing also is a bit critical so that's why we have a separate training team in university of oslo who kind of give uh, provide guidance and documents so that all these training programs that are con conducted everywhere in the globe are pretty standard otherwise like uh, because like i might interpret dhis2 and their tools in my own way and somebody else might do it uh, some other thing so this kind of can lead to fragmentation and really bad use experience so we are a bit concerned about that uh, that's why we have that governance perspective also addressed right and now i'm coming to something little bit techy about uh, about the software and the platform right so why is software important for sustainability of a dpg the thing is now especially when it comes to dhis2 which has been there for decades right so dhis2 of course can just uh, like be what it is right i mean because there are so many countries adopting it but it doesn't mean like after 5 years if dhis2 tries to remain the same that all these 100 countries will be using it right so that's why you have to be relevant to the requirement on the ground so we uh, we re, uh, dhis2 really respects that so with the change in requirements as well as changing context and the technology you have to keep evolving and we have to maintain kind of a governance where open source community can contribute as well as uh, you will maintain some level of uh, 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 co governance so that platform remains solid while incorporating all these different extensions and of course we have to be interoperable with the broad ecosystem so what is dhis2 so we have the core software and the extensions i think you will be uh, hearing more about this uh, from few other experts who will be talking about the dhis2 platform uh, and the extensions apps and things so i'm not going to get into too much detail so we have all these different components in the dhis2 core platform and top of that we have different extensions that we build so that we can really serve the requirements in local context another cool thing that we have uh to ensure that we we are relevant to the requirements on the ground is to have this feature prioritization so what we actually do is like so just imagine how does dhis2 know what to incorporate in the say version number 2.41 how do they know that how how does the core team knows so there are a couple of me mechanisms like one thing is like we 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 kind of uh, take note of all the requests uh that are coming from community of practice and then we have a internal hisp uh regional feature prioritization uh, mechanism we have a jira to request and to report bugs 
and then we have reports as well as implementation finding. So what you see on to your right is like the, the internal feature prioritization, I mean, and uh, extract from that. We are like, in the HISP, we have Hispatia hub, we have, uh, and three other, two other uh, hubs in Africa and Latin America, and we have the UIO. So all of us, like we keep kind of bidding, right? We, we want this feature for the next version. We want that. So with that, we have a kind of internal voting mechanism. And that's how uh, we are kind of prioritizing within the network, right? But like, I'm not saying that's the only source. Of course, we have some other mechanisms, but like that way we keep kind of sensitive to the changing requirements and uh, be relevant. So it's not just the core, it's more about local innovation. And of course, to maintain this balance is the kind of governance that we always require. Like we can be very generic uh, when it comes to the platform, but what you are seeing here is, uh, Again, a local innovation from Sri Lanka during the COVID-19 pandemic where we identified uh, contact mapping is really crucial and it kind of became an uh, extension or the web app in the core platform or in, or in the app hub. And we have this DHS2 app hub where all these different uh, apps, where the HISP and the UIO has produced is make, made available. So it's always about uh, balancing what should be in the core and what could be, what, I mean, I mean, but for everything else, you have to kind of have apps and things like that where things can become more, uh, I mean, can really support the local innovations. And of course, we have this uh, different uh, methodologies like design lab, which kind of deep dive into this entire design process, like what should, what should be there in the core, what should be there as local innovations and how to promote local innovations, how to make everything easy. And then finally, to make everything easy for the developers, we have total different, I mean, like uh, uh, entire like set of tools available. And all these are uh, made available on DHS2 website. So whoever who wants to contribute can really support. But having said that, uh, I also heard uh, one comment about funding. And I was, I was even wondering, Christine, what do you think? Like, isn't it the funding which is most crucial for a sustainability of a DPG? Or what do you think about that? <laughs> so this is a handing over, you know. So I would I would claim it's not the most important thing because you need to prove the concept because we have never had 10 years of funding. We only have half a year at a time. So you need to prove the concept every single day. So this is not this is doesn't come easy. And we started in 1994. So it took us many many years. It's, took um, six years only working in South Africa to make that uh, system scale in order to understand how to scale in a country. And that was traveling then very fast to Mozambique and to the Asia and to the rest of the Africa. So I think funding, it is part of it. It's super important and you need to work on it, but it's not, it cannot come first. It has to come as a, a grassroots engagement. And then you put the concept where there is good enough to fund or not because i really believe that because if you throw mo money after things it destroyed everything so sometimes when i'm in the panel next slide sometimes when i'm in the panel a public private partnership i said you don't need if it's too much money it's dangerous because then people are in it for the wrong reasons so we all we are in it for the good reasons so I would say whatever we have heard about um, um, Pamut talking about now is value-based community. We are all, sh all sharing the same values. And the fantastic part is that that also goes for our investor group. So how have we been able to seduce or to find those good investors? It's because of the good work happening in the countries. So. The proof of the pudding is happening in the countries and because it's happening in the countries, that's why we have been able to find the best partners, investors, there is. I think it's interesting because if you look at this slide, this slide was once upon a time made to see the correlation between money and number of countries. This is US dollars we're talking about. You can see the flat line there where we were surviving on research funds and, and exploitation of master students, PhD students, professors and associate professors that kept the whole shabang going for so many years. But then Global Fund, PEPFAR, 
still discussing who was actually planning the trip first, came to visit NORAD and us in 2012, 8 of December, actually, in fact, because they arrived in my house on the Christmas party where we had possible 20 PhD students from Africa and Asia present in that party. And the day after we had a meeting where we had a round and everybody was saying, oh, okay, I have my upgrade next week. I will defend my thesis in March, you know, and they were, what is going on here? What is community is this? And we believed we were super popular at that time, but that was 12 scaled on the 10, eight countries on the Asian, a lot of Asian states. And then of course, on the plans, in, in, in Global Fund, for, in very many countries had it on the plan. So they came to us and we had a meeting, the meeting in Oslo, Geneva, and Washington, and it ended up with a handshake agreement that all three party investment group for strengthening health information systems in countries was a handshake, no documents, $1 million each per year to solve this because we need, because all the money was going to the countries and activities in the countries. How could we make a sustainable platform that, have, that can support these countries 24 seven if there were no core? So we then started with this um, discussion, advocacy for investing in the core, not only in the countries. So we got, well, we, we have to tell that Nora has always been in the forefront. Thank you, Nora. <laughs> Already in 2010, we got a, a Nora issued um, an assessment saying you need to support the core because so many countries, okay, not, not that many countries to be honest, but still in the scale in the world, it seems to be very many. Then we got 4 million kroner, and you know what that is? $300,000, and we hired Lars, Ola, Martin. So Lars is the, the, the tech lead for the last, since then, since 10, 13 years. Ola is implementation boss. Martin is the back end, and Jan is the analytics. They're still here. Well, Lars is moving on a bit, still keeping us. So these four made a big difference. Whoops, jump. And then these millions from the, from the three uh, investors, you can see here, exploding. And then we did something smart, Lush, did a, did a, did a, a prototype of how PetFarm could monitor all their uh, investment in HIV in all the 58 countries with all the implementing partners with DHS2. They spent millions of dollars on a system that didn't work. And they said, okay, if you make this work, we are super happy that the rest of the 70 countries can use that platform to support, strengthen their own health information system. And that happened. So in, in May, 2015, we went global with all the 58 countries for PEPFAR. Well, you know, pretty cheap for, for Pepper in a way, but that was the one, the way that acknowledged that the core need to be invested in in order to be solid, to be sustainable, to be trusted, to have a 24 seven uptime, that we need to have versioning, that we need to have a big uh, software group. So this, of course, you know, for Pepper to secure the funds when Trump were elected, they needed to, uh, to get Gavi in to, to safeguard their investments. That's how you kind of making an investor group that actually we didn't do anything. We were just sitting there. And the rest of the guys and girls were picking, were getting others to safeguard investment, I mean, to support the, the, the strengthening in the countries. Like, like the Gavi was sitting here already from 14, sitting in all the meetings. But we had to wait for Karim to come in order to release that kind of initiatives. And Gavi is now one of the third. They don't like us to say it, but to be, to be honest, super important. And during the pandemic, 
all this trust built with these partners, they were able to mobilize money during the pandemic. So we just could say to our, at that time, 17 East groups, bang on, just support the countries. Don't think about the money. Think about support the country, do whatever you can, and we will, we will be able to pay the bill. So I think, yes, it's important, but it's super important what's going on in the countries because if because they will never come to us if it wasn't in the plan. It's too, totally demand driven. We have never gone and sell ourselves to any country because there's so many countries out in the world. So they are coming, please help us. Oh, it's on the plans. Somebody need to fund it. So I really think that it is a um, hen and the chicken thing, not uh, egg and the chicken, but it is of course super important. And we had to work hard from an informatics point of view to tell people it's not an out of box. It's not plug and play. It's hard work. And we need to do support. The, all the local innovation need to be in the countries for us to be able to understand all the use cases. That was also something that happened during the pandemic. And I will stop now but because we will discuss it more on Thursday when we discuss the, the looking back and going for the future, uh, turning the DHS2 platform even more into an innovative platform for innovation in the finishes, I, I will say. During the pandemic, we really saw that the innovations in the countries were the most, most important and created hope for all the other countries to be able to borrow, steal, domesticate those innovations to support their own countries. Stopping here. Because, huh? Apti, of, of course. Please, Apti is not coming because otherwise we will not no time for panel. So we are keeping the questions for the panel. Okay? Or for the break. This okay. Yes, yeah, so we will load the customer. Okay. Like if you like to just hold it, you don't take that. Okay. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Uh, so hi, everyone. But uh, I think I guess it's a two hour session post lunch. Uh, must be heavy. But thank you so much for being here. I think it's a full house. So I clearly speaks a lot about the session content that we're sharing here. So first off, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Aishani. I'm from Apti Institute. So we're a Bangalore-based India organization. Uh, we're a tech public policy organization working on the intersection of tech and society. So a lot of times we get asked whether we have, you know, whether we're the tech experts. And that's when we say that we're not really experts in tech, but we're experts in understanding the impact of tech on people, on community, and, uh, you know, we come from a space, from the social science space, where we try to understand concepts such as risks and harms and how it really impacts citizens. And we look at questions of governance and data privacy. So that's broadly what we do at APTI. But today at the DHIS2 conference, we find a place because we are currently now focusing on understanding digital public goods. And I think uh, Liv, as well as Pomod, have done a great job in just setting up context of you know what digital public goods are. Uh, but where we come from, we are currently focusing on a very specific piece of uh, research, which is on communities. So when I talk about communities, and I think this is something that Pomod cover, covered in his part of the organization, uh, part of the presentation was building communities around DPGs and how that kind of enables sustainability of DPGs in the long run. So at APTI, we're planning on building a playbook which describes or puts forth a roadmap of how DPGs can go about building communities. Now, given that communities, uh, DHIS2 has done a fantastic job in building the community, but back home, 
a lot of the DPGs in India do not have this context. So at APTI, we have been working on digital public goods at multiple levels. We've been looking at it from the context of diversity, Okay, uh, sorry, uh, diversity, access and inclusion. So you, there's one part of our work which we do, which we have, we have been working with MOSIP and we're trying to look at, you know, enabling access and inclusion in the rollout of MOSIP, helping them roll, roll it out as and when they think about these more important questions related to diversity and accessing, mar like targeting marginalized communities and that's our little bit uh, just a very brief work that we do with MOSIP. Apart from that we're working on this piece related to communities and this project is being funded by ONI. On a parallel project we're looking broadly at uh, digital public infrastructure and uh, what the institutional capacity for that looks like. So for us capacity means two things tech and institutional tech is not the is not where we come from and it's not the expertise that we have but where we do have expertise is building the institutional capacity right and that's the piece of pro that's another piece of project that we're working on but today specifically uh, i think you know most of us uh, coming from like the non tech space we we and in this room like mostly i was in a room uh, yesterday and it was filled with all the tech people and uh, i was asked this question of you know where why is it that we find a space in specifically in the dhis2 conference and that brings me to answer it simply speaking dhis2 has cracked it in terms of how you go about building a community right and this community is not only comprising of people from the tech side but as well as from the non-tech side having a robust set of non like practitioners the implementationers uh, and all of these people coming together which is very active which is vibrant and that then contributing to the sustainability of dhis2 as a platform right uh, so we want to be able to highlight and understand what exactly has dhis2 done right when they went about building the community. So understanding that journey for us has become very critical. So where we come from, we have identified four stages. And I think this is something that Liv also mentioned in her discussion, which is you create the DPG, you deploy it, and then there's evolution and then there's sustenance, right? So there are four stages to it. Now in the last two stages is where we see usually DPGs finding it a bit hard to sustain to grapple or that's the problem they uh, that, the, that they usually grapple with and that is where we see that communities can play a very important role in the evolution and the sustenance right so i think that's the key point uh, or that's the void in literature that we want to be able to fill uh just you know like uh an experience and you know like why this conference is going to be very helpful to our study is uh, my colleague and I, Saujanya, yesterday, we had a tour of the use case bazaar. And I think just being a part of that use case bazaar gave us a very good insight of how the community is in action, right? So we met a lot of people, we met, a, we, we were able to identify the various touch points, the various stakeholders, and also to speak of it, how diversity, both in terms of culture, as well as your professional backgrounds, it's not just, you know, diversity only in terms of tech versus non-tech, but also just uh, seeing people come from so many places and apply, being able to apply it in context specific situations, responding to the local needs, gave us an overall idea of how this community is actually sustaining the platform and one of the major reasons of why it's surviving today. Right. So we've had prior conversations with folks at DHIS2 previously, but those were like online conversations. And, you know, it was uh, just one hour calls wherein we try to understand what the journey of community building has looked like for DHIS2. And they were very insightful. But being a part of this conference has taken it to another level wherein we're getting on ground insight of how the community actually communicates, you know, something as simple as that, which we probably wouldn't have if we were just uh, uh, online back in India. Now, the primary reason why we want to be able to do this or like, what is it that we seek to gain from all the learnings that we kind of take back home? Uh, what is it that we're going to do with it, right? So back in India, we are working with two organizations 
eGov Foundation and Beckin. Both of these, I would call them uh, a DPG creator of themselves. So Beckin is working on decentralizing uh, decent, decentralizing networks, and they're specifically working on mobility. And in mobility, they've been very good. Uh, they've been successful at building an app. It's called Namayatri, and uh, it kind of connects driver partners as well as consumers. And that is one part of the work that they do. And now they're looking to expand. Similarly, we have Ega Foundation, who we're also working with very closely. And they are a citizen-centric uh, delivery platform. And they try to you know, correct the market failures that occur between access to services by citizens. Right now, these plat uh, these organizations are very similar to, you know, what DHIS two has been doing, but there's a very big difference. So DHIS two has cracked it for themselves in terms of you know, uh, building the community around them. They are a more mature DPG. However, eGov and Beckin, though eGov especially has been in this space for the past twenty years they haven't taken the approach of surviving through the community mechanism, right? So we see eGov and Beckin are thinking about questions related to community now. And that is why we want to be able to understand how exactly communities are built, because we think that community is the way of answering or could be the answer for organizations like or DPGs like Beckin and eGov back home, when now they're thinking of the next step, right? So they are thinking about uh, scalability, inclusivity, and questions of global adoption. And that's where they see that there's a certain gap. And that is where the community can really step up and help them in achieving their next goals. So we are working very closely with these organizations. What we want to do is gather all the knowledge that we can uh, and the research, of course, that's been happening at the back end uh, to be able to build out a roadmap, which very, uh, you know, which very simply puts across what communities, uh, how communities are built. Uh, right. So you could see that this is broadly the two part structure. The first part is of our research is the learn framework. And then the second part is the engage framework. The learn framework is why we're here today, part of the DHIS2 conference, uh, understanding how mature DPGs have built communities. And the second part of the framework is where we you know, are working very closely with Beckin and Ega to draw an outline of how we go about, how we could help them in building the communities, taking some very actionable pathways, putting it into action, uh, and like helping them in specific areas where they think they require help in thinking about building communities, right? Now, broadly, what the outcomes of the project are is a, I think I've reiterated many times, is how do you build communities, but also how communities can be viewed as actions and uh, as agents of diversity and inclusion. And at the same time, how the gov governance and culture of communities can enable long-term sustainability of the DPG. And this is where, uh, this is where uh, the research is currently at. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of the, uh, the research methodology that we adopted, but I will not deep dive into it. We're currently in the phase where we're, you know, conducting surveys, part participating in workshops, attending conferences, gaining more knowledge. This is a snapshot of the two organizations that I mentioned, eGov and Beckin, uh, and I broadly outlined the, their goals, their needs. Now, in all, what we want to be able to do is that we do agree that every DPG has its own way of going about building a community. Their needs are different, their goals are different, governance is different, the, their stakeholders are different. Also the sectors that they're catering to is very different, right? So we do acknowledge that there is a certain uniqueness to go about building a community. But what we want to be able to do is get that least common denominator or the common thread of you know what could be abstracted from all of their journeys and then go about building a roadmap, which can help DPGs answer the question of, okay, if I want to build a community, where do I even start? 
right? Uh, you have the technical expertise, you have so many people working with you, but you really don't know how to divert your manpower into what areas, which stakeholders do we even think about? Like, you know, do we target students? Do we target like academic institutions? Uh, do we go to like ministries? So I we, fee, we see that, and these are like questions that we have got by speaking to EGov and Beckin and other DPGs in India. And these are some of the questions that they are grappling with. So this is a very quick snapshot of what the playbook looks like, but uh, I would like to end there. And uh, this is just a very brief snapshot of what we have been doing, what we want to do do at the conference, what we want to gain from the conference. But what we are doing is a, a one and a half hour session tomorrow. There's a workshop uh, and it's an interactive workshop where we would uh, not, be, not be spending more than 10 minutes on explaining what we are doing. But majority of the time, about 70 minutes slotted just for discussions and activities where we want to be able to take inputs from people like the people in the room today, uh, where y'all could give us an insight of what the journey of the community has been for you and what are the challenges and the barriers. And in general, understanding, you know, where are the gaps that occur, uh, what are the values of the community and how do you go about building the community, both in terms of processes, as well as reaching out to the right persons who could then help take your DPG to the next level, right? Uh, that's it. And I would end there. Uh, question. So five o'clock tomorrow, isn't it? Yes, it's at five. So it's uh, eight thirty. It's a, it's a different time. Really. <laughs> so, okay. So then I think we 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 still have time for for panel, but then I so can I call upon the uh, Ministry of Health from Sri Lanka, Minister of Health from Timor Leste. Eric Feiring from Norad, you will be the first, and then uh, which of you sitting in the panel? Rati, uh, Pamu, do you think so? we'll be using this one? So please sit, Pam. Then you can have this. Yeah. You know the because the new comer is first, and then of course the one that has spent much time talking can also be there, but uh, a little bit more in the background. Pamud, you can sit also. Yes. Can can. <laughs> so we just jump ahead because time is flying, and uh, I have uh, Nora at, at my first site here. So so um, we heard a lot from Limarte. Um, explaining the how it all started and uh, the global digital global good alliance but could you um eric talk a bit why is norad interested in dpgs from where is that coming okay we have one each thanks <laughs> good uh, first i must say thank you to all of the presenters i've learned so much just being here so thank you so much for that uh, no, I think uh, digital public goods, as as Liv said, I think key point is sovereignty. Uh, I think we saw that, I mean, we see that this in Norway as well, but we saw that lots of countries are either locked in in proprietary solutions with vendor lock-ins or have to, I would say, submit some of their digital sovereignty to other countries in order to be able to use their solutions. So what we wanted to do was to come up with like a third option, something that was not locked in to pri proprietary solutions and where you did not have to link yourself too closely to another country unless you wanted to. Uh, and just to, to take something, a code, a solution and adapt it to your own needs and have full digital sovereignty, either locally or, or, or nationally. Uh, so I think that's, that's, I think is a key motivation. But then there's also an efficiency point of view, because looking at countries, digital public goods are solutions that, because of how they are designed, they scale really well, which is good for countries and, and others implementing these solutions. Uh, but I think also for us as a donor, we saw that we, I mean, we have been funding project, one project at a time in one setting at one time. And then if you want to do the same thing because it's really successful, we have to do everything over again. So it's it's not very cost effective, but if you design in scalability from the very start, we should do with pu digital public goods. It's also a way for us to 
invest our relatively small money in a way that is cost efficient and uh, just scales well. So I think for us, those are the, the, the two key motivations. And that is why Norway was one of the co-founders co -founders of the Digital Public Goods Alliance and why we are now co-host, NORAD is co-hosting the Secretariat of the DPGA. I need to add for, for information, and you could have a comment on that one as well. NORAD has actually invested, we could hear the, uh, the interest of the capacity, invested in 10 scholarships, building capacity on digital public infrastructure in countries in the HISP group. So we have uh, already recruited nine of them and two of them in, in the room. So, so one reflection from that? Investing in PhD well, no, no, I think scholarships? Generally, uh, I think we, we don't know enough about what truly makes a DPG sustainable. Uh, I mean, it seems APTI is on a really good journey to, to enlighten us. Uh, also, we know there is a lot to learn from the DHS2 experience, but still, we don't really know. And I must also say, even if we see how you've done it with DHS2, it took decades. So what we need to look at is how can we replicate some of those things in a much shorter time? So we might need to look at new solutions to, to replicate that. And of course, our collaboration with you is part of bringing new knowledge to this field, finding out how can the DHS2 experience be applied elsewhere? And also what can you learn from what is being done at a record pace in other parts of the world right now on DPGs. Thank you. Can we pass on to the next? So Sri Lanka, you are very well known to, to invest uh, for many years into uh, DHS2 first maybe, but then later also many other DPGs. How are you being able, to, any reflections on sustainability of more than one DPG? You have your experience with DIVOC, you have now, heading into the MOSIP. So any reflection on how you plan to sustain several DPGs? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting question and uh, challenging question. Now, I, I suppose you know the story about the DHS2 in Sri Lanka. I think it's been from 2010-11, we have been doing a lot of work with the DHS2. Then around uh, 2018, uh, we were with the Global Fund, we were embarking on a new journey like uh, developing a digital health architecture blueprint for Sri Lanka. So now uh, the project started that time, but uh, we have just completed the, this whole process. Uh, with that, a uh, lot of learning came and a lot of insight came to the sustainability of these application sites. So that's why actually we selected, uh, even within the blueprint, we identified as a principle open source, open standards, and uh, getting those things into the policies, policy level, is that because whatever we said and done at the country level, uh, the administrators should uh, buy in for these things. Otherwise, they will uh, spend money on uh, other proprietary things. Even though these are globally accepted, but it has to be uh, going to the, uh, now at the Ministry of Health level, uh, they, they basically accepted these principles from the director general to other people. So we, we are working on this open MRS. There's one project uh, in uh, hospital health information system, open SRP. We are working with the, uh, uh, this WDF project. And then uh, MOSIP ICTA is working on this. So likewise, there are many things uh, we are and at the same time, we are looking at the capacity building of these open uh, digital public goods, uh, especially working with the health informatics community, uh, this uh, postgraduate institute board of studies. So we are embed uh, embedded in certain component of this uh, DHS2 and other open source things into the MSc and MD curricula as a part of this, because otherwise, even with the DHS2, you know, about 10 years we are working with, but still we find difficult sometimes to sustain certain things, especially in scaling up the systems, because there are about six, seven DHS2 based systems. So we need to uh, build in those things into the curriculums of the postgraduate uh, institute. Yeah. Yeah, Sri Lanka has been very successful actually having uh, uh, the, the public infrastructure as part 
of the curriculum in the, even the medical studies. So that's that's kind of a very, very interesting approach from Sri Lanka that you are pretty, uh, maybe the first. So any other challenges you see with sustaining? Um, yeah, uh, now we are just thinking about this, uh, uh, this software application as one part, but there are, in, if you take the uh, this uh, whole ecosystem in WHO, building blocks, there are seven components of this infrastructure, governance, which are, there are different areas when we deploying this application. So we have to think about all these different areas also uh, to ensure the sustainability, not only the software application, that is one thing. Another thing is I really appreciate the if Sri Lanka, what they are doing, uh, it's a good collaboration with the Ministry of Health and other, other partners. So we need to have some kind of a sustain that partnership as well so for the for the long term thank you thank you uh, can we go over to Timo Lest? Uh, you are you are a bit um, uh, earlier in the process of, of uh, deploying dpgs but i know you have uh, experience with the, with the dhs2 and we also heard you have problems with integrating with the other systems that you are using so what kind of challenges are you seeing sustaining uh, DPG in Timor-Leste? Okay, thank you very much. This is a very interesting question. So as our experience, this is uh, like as uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Minister of Health, but we are like behind of that, uh, if you want to compare. Uh, so we just started uh, THIS in 2014 um, for the preparation, but up to now we have, we face a lot of uh, challenge uh, because many things, as mentioned by the our friend from the Sri Lanka, Minister of Sri Lanka, that there is not only the software, but uh, the infrastructure, the capacity building, uh, the human resource and then funding uh, also, and then the knowledge, transfer knowledge of the um, advisor uh, to the um, local, uh, health staff, especially for the technical, and then it's like too many things there. For uh, and then we also say, uh, see from the government part, uh, like uh, management and then technical. For the management, the people agree and then receive very well that this uh, software, and then we'll have a commit commitment to implement, even though uh, still face the challenge. But for the technical, it's not get ready. Uh, after I'm not saying that not get ready, but like still facing a lot of the technical things uh, because of the we have the advisor but we are ch the change uh, uh, every time is this the one the second one is like um, up to now we not uh, as an administrator for this um dhis we call it tlhs this is the second the third one uh if you would like uh now we are in progress to update the all the many indicators based on the global SDH and then uh, national indicator. Um, but uh, the, this, the software is not updated yet. Uh, we still use uh, 2.26. And then if someone's coming to give the training, they have used different uh, version, it's, it become the challenge also, because what you will learn from the training is different with the, the actual situation. So we face a lot of the things for the technical. Maybe like when the people come to, to help us, need to gradually see one by one what the site, especially in the technical things, and then we will receive for the other infrastructure and then uh, finance. Thank you. So, Pamud, any comments from your side since uh, his Sri Lanka is the one supporting Timolas? <laughs> It's Sorry, a, that's a bad a, one. That's that's a, that's a very interesting question. So now now it's it's quite interesting. Like you can see, we kind of uh, we can do even comparison, right? So we have Sri Lanka and we have Timor Leste, and so there is again like no secret recipe. Like if we are doing something really wonderful, really fast in one country, that we go and support another country, the things work the same, right? It's very contextual, as I was trying to frame. Uh, as I mentioned, like. The software and the team supporting is just one element, but like we are kind of trying to do a 
it's it's part of the digital transformation as we would uh, call it in the academia right so we have, we have to do the entire so there has to be a kind of a transformational process while we try to implement the dpg like dhis2 so uh, as uh, mana natalia mentioned like if the infrastructure and like if you don't have a proper capacity building mechanism which is already in place in the country and then like uh, uh, the the human resources is not properly there in the ministry it's it's very different uh, when we try to implement like for example in sri lanka like human resources is not like comparatively again is not a major problem like you have like trained resources like you have very good ones but it's it's a more of a matter of distribution and things like that whereas in 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 timor leste like uh, i mean it's it's a whole different scenario infrastructure is the same right uh, even the government funding it, it's it again is the same so it's more about like it's a very good question so it's like like uh, so even if you keep the same variable like uh, the same uh, regional his group which is supporting multiple countries if the country context is different things can be the the pace at at which we are kind of uh, doing the transformation can be really different i will stop there i think uh, others need to come in yeah so one question to update i'm so sorry we haven't really introduced people with names so we need to do another round with the names so please introduce yourself first but but i just have one question for you and maybe it's it's wrong input but i could i can hear from the global uh, for public digital good alliance and others actors uh, maybe not up to but you can you can uh, you can comment on it uh, promoting countries to deploy many dpgs and when we hear about this capacity building challenges how come that is kind of the rhetorics that you shall have many dpgs i'm just what are, what are your experiences when you give advices yeah uh hi i am Saujani, and I hope everybody can hear me all right. Uh, I work with Apti, my, you just heard my colleague speak. So um, to just jump right in to what uh, Christian, uh, Christian just asked, right? Uh, how do you promote the adoption of DPGs while also contending with questions of capacity, whether it's at the country level or at broader global regional level, right? And this is something we've been working on at Apti as a research institute for a while now, where we see that promoting DPG, DPGs should go hand in hand with the creation of certain safeguards in the country context. It's not possible, and, and this is often a bitter pill to swallow, which is that you can't rule out digital public goods or digital public infrastructure where you don't have whether existing infrastructure to support such uh, innovation, right? The reason why uh, in India, for instance, we were able to have fast payment systems through our phone is because by 2016, when this rollout happened, we had a vast majority of the pop population, over 60% with smartphones. And now in 2023, we have about 90% with smartphones. We're able to integrate and identify so many people for welfare schemes because our digital ID uh, has been adopted again, enjoys about 93% adoption. But to be able to innovate, we had a combination of factors came together at the heart of which is often political will, right? And, and you need political will, not just in the highest uh, you know, corridors of power in your governments, but you also need political will and capacity to be built at the level of districts and at the level of uh, smaller towns. And in the case of India, what worked is that we tried to, uh, and this is something Apti has uh, done research about, which is they tried to empower existing officials to become agents for the rollout of digital public goods. Like, for instance, when we had COVID and um, vaccine distribution was a question that India was grappling with. What they decided to do at the level of villages was to uh, call on local health workers to become the agents who help village level populations sign up on tech platforms to access vaccines. So we don't see digital public goods as a replacement for existing welfare schemes or existing modes of welfare delivery, as some, but as something that will help uh, augment existing systems, right? Having said that, uh, one thing is important to note is that in the Indian experience, we had some technical capacity within our country in trying to build this. We had some political appetite, whether it's from the highest corridors of power in the government or at the level of local administrators. And there was also 
some knowledge that was created from our experience of rolling out fast payment systems called UPI and Aadhaar, our digital ID system, that we are now trying to use to build more systems. We're, so we're doing our own health uh, digital public infrastructure. It's called the National Digital Health Machine. We're trying to do it in the space of e-commerce and so on. But in trying to do so, it, it's also become imminent that we can't be a walled garden in our experience and we need to be able to document and socialize uh, the story of building DPI and DPGs, mostly because capacity is only a small part of it. It's also we've realized uh, knowledge sharing and documentation is just as important. And uh, that's what we're trying to do now as a part of India's G20 presidency. And I, I mean, I will stop here, but Aapti is doing a playbook on digital public infrastructure, which will be published sometime in August. And uh, yeah, we'd be happy to share that as well. Thank you. So maybe we could have a, a you know your you know presentation of yourself the names since I forgot it was supposed to be on the slide but it didn't appear and then maybe people we can have time for a couple of questions if anyone has questions for the panel you can prepare yourself for the uh, okay my name is Mariana Pale I'm head of the policy planning and M&E department um, Minister of Health Timor Leste I'm Dr Pale Takarnopema. Uh, Director, Health Information, Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. Uh, I think I was partly introduced, but uh, my, my name is Eric Feiring. Uh, so I'm Assistant Director in NORAD, the Norwegian Agency for Development Corporation, where I lead our work on innovation, technology, and digitalization. So only partly. I only use the first name, you know, Norwegian. Nor uh, do we have time? Can I add a little bit? Um, I think it was a question that came up earlier uh, about how we think as as funders, because I think many of, of the other points around how you create a sustainable uh, DPG has been well covered and others in the panel can can cover those better. But I think especially on the funding part and what you said, Kirsten, is, is quite interesting. I think we have seen that we're trying to constantly uh, understand and evaluate our place in the ecosystem and how, how we can add most value. We're not a very big donor. We might be punching above our weight on this particular topic, but Norway is not that big. So I think what we found is we can actually provide that core support because we don't have the country presence that some other big bilateral donors have, but we have quite a risk appetite in the sense that we, we can put our weight behind something that is not yet well proven. I think we came in relatively early with the HS2. Yeah, <laughs> so 20 years later, but still. Uh, I think with, with MOSIP, we came in uh, after Gates Foundation and OMDR and a few other uh, quite visionary philanthropists had, had been uh, worked with them for, for a few years, but as the first bilateral. Uh, so that, I think that's, and now with OpenCRVS, which is a small, uh, which is a, a civil rights and vital statistics system that can uh, interact quite well with MOSIP and some of the other parts of the foundational DPI stack that is being built. There we have come in very early as the first big institutional donor with a long-term small investment for five years with them. So I think we have that. I think that is the role we can play. And seeing how the dynamics play out now, there is and should be almost exclusively South-South collaboration on this in terms of sharing the technology, sharing experiences. But we think we as a North actor can have that flexible long-term core funding as well as working together in the political space and the normative space about creating awareness. Right now, that's where we see ourselves in the ecosystem. Uh, so just to clarify those points. Thanks. Super. Uh, Saptarshi has a question. So yeah, hi. Um, I'm Saptarshi Purkasta from Indiana University um, and Regan Chief Institute. Um, my question is uh, first an appreciation of what you mentioned, but um, having known the history of how Norhead which is the capacity building initiative in education has supported. I think that is unique to NORAD in the sense that there are very few global institutions, funders from, from countries who have supported uh, programs in capacity building, I think, parallel to DPGs. So I think that's an appreciation. My question is, um, how do you see um, this walled garden approach that uh, a lot of um, institutions take or countries in, in fact take and um, how do you see, um, and this is also to Apti in the sense, how do you think, um, because DHS2 in, in a sense has many 
um, adopters who actually claim that DHIS2 is theirs, right? Which a lot of other DPGs don't. So how do you encourage other organizations to have people build that together uh, approach? And how does sort of a country which has already built a platform like the India stack, not make it India stack only, like makes it a global stack? So really great question. I think, first of all, I think what DHS2 and HISP has done so well is to create this multi-local community. It has several very strong localizations. And, and I think that's something that should one should look at for other DPGs as well. Well, I mean, one, one point is NORAD is supporting MOSIP. We're not supporting Aadhaar. So there is that arm's length to the government of India, but it's still the Indian experience it's Indian technology. It's it's a force, a powerful force, but it is one step removed from the government of India, which I think is 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 why this might be even more forceful. Because then that means it's it's not hard power; it's soft power and knowledge exchange and learning. And and I think that's also why Norway and India can then be really uh, strong um, partners in in promoting this agenda going forward. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and send it over to you. And then we have one more question. And then I think next question. Yeah. Um, to just answer your question very pointedly about how do you cease to make something just the India stack and make it a more globalized stack, uh, that in a way encapsulates all of India's G20 agenda at uh, this year, right? The core of their presidency is to push for a DPI approach and, uh, and they partnered with UNDP to precisely uh, do this, build those knowledge base and resources that in some way encapsulate not just India's experience of building digital public infrastructure, but also borrow from experiences of countries like Brazil that has its own PIC system, experience of Singapore with its pay now and all of those. And to see how, you know, have like even a global compendium of DPGs and DPI and see how some countries have made progress and what are the best practices that have worked so this is definitely a knowledge product that is can you know further the conversation in this space and to specifically uh answer your question about um uh, india stack itself right and the brain behind this is dr pramod varma and he's recently been made the uh head of something called the center for digital public center for excellence in digital public infrastructure yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, center. Sorry. <laughs> yes, it's also housed in uh, Bangalore, and uh, part of his job at CDPI is to make uh, India stack global and to see uh, if there can be integrations happening. And some of that is happening now. India's fast payment system can be used in Singapore as well. They're speaking to France to use it. So yeah, I'll stop there. One short question. Very short and. Starting, yes, 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 yes. And since you are a presenter, can I direct this question to you, Christine? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I first of all, I want my name is George Odongo, I'm from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, I want to agree with you that funding is not everything, uh, you have been able to sustain this uh, global good uh, without even uh, much funding. Now, um, I saw Emmanuel mention this the one word that is not brought clearly among the factors that has enabled you to sustain this program, that is collaboration. He mentioned it very small bullet point with ministries of health, but at a higher level, I want to hear your comments about the collaborations that you have had with CDC, WHO, where they are, global public health specialist subject matter expertise from my position where i sit i've i've seen that collaboration and engagement work before money flowing so any i don't i don't see it as one of your major bullet points for sustaining this global good so your comments you know, about that. so many bullet points and so many <laughs> slides i'm so sorry i didn't come out you know to the cdc because uh, I, I, I you mentioned also who we can start there of course, WHO has been extremely important for us. We have been 
collaborating with, with WHO the, for the last 12 years, and we are a collaborative center for strengthening health information systems in countries. And the work we have always had secondment into the WHO, and we are actually, and I would say, WHO is using us as a dissemination platform for best practices and metadata packages in the collaboration with Gavi and Global Fund. So yes, very instrumental, super important to be able to discuss with the people that have evidence research on what are the best indicator, how can we try to adapt it to countries? Because we know as informaticians, we know that a database, an indicator can be designed very good and very bad. So we need to, to support the very good ones. And with the CDC, we have had a, a very, very good collaboration with CDC or uh, from the Ebola time. From that time, we, we started to come to con, um, to make the platform to become a disease surveillance platform and not only for routine public health uh, monitoring. And then later uh, we we won actually, normally we are sole source in many open, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, we won that uh, collaborative agreement, agreement on uh, from CDC, which has been extremely important for us with COVID-19 and beyond. That helped us a lot with the collaboration with the CDC it helped us a lot during the pandemic and thanks to CDC, very much of the success we were able to support 60 countries during the pandemic. So absolutely, uh, the collaboration with public health institutions, as well as the public health institution in Norway has been super important for us to have this uh, interdisciplinarity approach to solving the social challenges within health and later, of course, also in education and now in climate, you know, so the domain knowledge is super important for us and that's our approach. So if that wasn't clear from the presentations, <laughs> that was a misunderstanding. <laughs> and when it comes to the funding is not so important, I will be killed. Of course it's important. <laughs> but, but it's not from, it's not all and it's not from the beginning. It shall be kind of evolving with your success i think mobilizing as partners and i really think i believe that when you work in collaboration with partners you become better and you have to have smart investors not dumb investors if there are any many of them okay but thank you so much we are now running into a new session for uh, cross sector monitoring of uh, progress actually uh, sdgs that will be happening in the uh, auditorium one but before that, we need a coffee break. And thank you so much for attending this session for the presenters. I think this has been a super cool, a very good it's session and it's to be continued the discussion Atlanta. in the coffee break. Atlanta. And Coffee and Andrew, you have to oh, come here. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. We need to, talk. We need to collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We had to borrow the list without your permission. Okay. So, <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Thank you.